Let's, uh, let's just have a comment. Dr. Siegel, you always have something you want to tell the audience. <laughs> and, and I know <laughs> that today is no different. Of course not. So, can, can, Why would that be different? What is the, what is the pearl of wisdom you're going to leave everybody with um, online and on site here before uh, the day's over? My online pearl wisdom for today is be the change that you want to see in your patients. Be the change yourself, model it, live it, experience it, and share it. Awesome. Do you have as, as good of a pearl, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> a young doctor, you know? <laughs> Listening to the wisdom and, you know, <laughs> yes. I, I, I do have a lot of philosophisms, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I would say, um, in, in conjunction with the don't afraid to be different that Dr. Siegel said, um, only the ones that believe in you are the ones that you need to dedicate energy to. That's what I would say. So mm -hmm. whatever you believe in, the ones that believe in you are the only ones that deserve to, that you need to dedicate anything to. Because the others, when they're ready, they'll come. You just gotta believe in yourself. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you. And as you did that, we have all of our panelists now up on uh, line as well. So I'm going to give each of you. I, I, that was really cool. So what I'm going <laughs> to do is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to extend that to you online there. So Dr. Roman, just it's got to be like 10 seconds. OK, it's got to be <laughs> short. But this pearl of wisdom that you have for everybody, what is it? Uh-oh, audio? You're, you got to unmute. Do we have audio oh, I'm not here? Mute. There I, we I, go. I'm, 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 You're good. Okay. You're good, Margot. Okay. Let your passion drive you. Uh, mm. And when you, you find the reason for your, uh, your you know, the, the driving force, then, then try to, to keep it focused so that you can get it done. Mm. Good. Excellent. Now, you guys are sweating, Dr. Jean and Betsy and uh, Jill. You're sweating because you know you're next. So, Dr. Jean, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and go for us here? You got something. I think uh, we should have in mind that the discover of ozone is for science, discover of fire in terms of medical revolution but read, study, and have your experience, not only what colleagues report. I think it will make a, a, a big difference in your medical approach. Very good. Good, awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hershey. Uh, don't be afraid to go outside your comfort zone. It's the only way you're gonna learn and grow. And you can teach an old vet new tricks. <laughs> awesome. And finally, Dr. Rubin. Uh, learn from your mistakes. Laugh along the way. I think uh, laughter is great yeah. medicine. And uh, we've certainly all made them, and I'm sure we've all felt bad about them. But without them, we would never learn. So failure can be a success. And being different can also be a success. Mm. Wonderful, thank you guys. Um, I did have a, a little bit of a funny comment in the slide there. When I said 10 seconds to Dr. Roman, uh, somebody commented, 10 seconds, do you know Margot? <laughs> <laughs> but she did an amazing job. That wasn't actually about 10 seconds, so good job. Okay. Um, well, I, I do want to make another comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Was, you're gonna so prove her right. Everyone's, everyone's participation in this, this has been wonderful. And things that people are doing, and, and, and I'm so excited about the research and what Betsy's doing with her oncology, and, and, and it is, and you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to comment on, on, you know, Zachary's introduction and Marlene's motivation and Jill's, you know, they are just wonderful, and I'm so excited to feel like, you know, I feel like I birthed a lot of stuff, and it, and it feels, you know, it, it's wonderful. <laughs> You know, it's a very nice feeling. So. Mm. Awesome. Well, thank you. Anyway, yeah. That's 
I, I've loved this, actually. I, I wish I didn't have to run around and do a lot of things because I've really enjoyed listening to all of you guys the little bit I've got to listen to. But I will, I promise you, listen to the lectures a little bit more closely when I get back. Um, so we're going to start, like I said, with some questions for uh, Dr. Joaquim from Brazil. And um, then we'll move on from there to a few other questions as well. So um, the first one that I wanted to ask from your lecture now, I don't know if this applies directly or not, but it was how um, does ozone maybe help with Lyme disease? And are you guys, is that an issue for you guys there in Brazil? Uh, sorry, I don't get a question. Yeah, so Lyme disease. Lyme, Lyme disease? Is that Oh, something? Lyme disease. Oh, so, uh, we don't have Lyme disease in Brazil. It's mm -hmm. very rare. We have ehrlichiosis, that's a different kind of rickettsiosis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know from USA, I, 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 I study many cases, and I know you use a lot of ozone for this, and it's very helpful. I think Dr. Margo can talk mm -hmm. better about this than me. But I know that it's very useful for Lyme disease, in, in reality for Lyme sequel, because you, you, you still have Lyme after treatment, you still have some sequel of the disease, but I see a lot of people using ozone with great success for this kind of disease, especially uh, major autoemotherapy. Good. Yeah, and I think adding the ultraviolet to it just potentiates it more. So adding the, mm -hmm. you know, the UVA, UVC, and then and adding photobiomodulation, you know, you're getting um, a, a potentiation of the ozone. Good. Um, I know this one will be something that you can speak to, Dr. Joaquim. Um, how is intra-articular injection of ozone with PRP more beneficial? Did you get that? Uh, because... Oh. Ozone can activate the PRP. It can stimulate the degranulation of the platelets. So the growth factors are released in more quantity and more quickly. And despite this, you have the own effect of ozone that are pretty much different from PRP. So you can combine both mechanism of action Great, and Dr. Sheck here uh, on site has a follow-up to that, so I'll let him ask his question. Yeah, I'm just curious, you also mentioned uh, when you were talking about stem cell that you don't necessarily inject those at the same time. Um, what's the difference between that and the PRP? Or maybe I'm sorry. I think we can't hear the audio, Jonathan. I think you need to, so, to tell us. So the question was, um, in, with stem cells, would you inject ozone? It doesn't sound like you'd inject it at the same time. Can you talk about the difference with stem cells as opposed to PRP? Yes, you can't do uh, at the same time stem cells with ozone because ozone depends on the concentration can damage the stem cells. Not that much, but can damage. So you can do ozone intraarticular and wait five minutes and then you can put stem cells but not at the same time. Perfect. Do you... Uh, not this, yet. Maybe in the future. Okay. And, and I, I'm just curious because I've heard that before, something like that. Do you have any... Is there research on that or is this just something uh, that they're, they're speculating on? Uh, we have done some research trying to put together stem cells with ozone and we saw some cell damage. So we don't know the, the, the ideal concentration to put them together. So we have stopped this research due to, to pandemic issue and the cost because we need to throw away the stem cells after we mix, we just do that and take it to the lab. Uh, so it's, it's something new. Great, thank you very much. But the other half of his question was, what's the difference between the stem cell versus a PRP? Can we mix it with PRP or do you see the same damage? Yes, we can. So they're not differentiated yet. He answered that. Yeah, okay. 
So yeah, next, when I when I do it, I inject it and then I leave the needle in. You know, wait a few. You know, it's probably because the ozone is going to be picked up in 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 milliseconds, right? So you just, I figure I'm, I've opened that joint area with the needle. I don't take the needle out. I let it sit there. So I haven't really injected another site. And then I put the, the anything added into that uh, as well. So, you know, if you're gonna do it with PRP, then do it at that point, you know, let it, don't, don't do it like an, in the same syringe, mix it like you do with uh, minor autohemotherapy. So that actually is different than what we're hearing, right? Because uh, Dr. Jean was saying they do actually mix the PRP and ozone together. Yes, yeah, yeah, PRP, can, and, I, yeah. PRP and ozone together, it's okay. Ozone and stem cells, you need to wait a while. Right. And you can mix PRP and stem cells, but there is no advantage of doing that. Okay. Just stem cells are enough. Good. Um, this is another question on, and I'm sorry if I I'm if I cut people off. We have 47 questions online. No, 37. So there's a lot of questions here. We're going to try to move through uh, some of them at least. What form of ozone is used to treat cognitive disorders in canine patients? So how would you administer ozone to treat cognitive issues? Well, I've done it. Uh, the UVBI and, and regular ozone, both rectal and sub-Q, and I have had dogs that didn't know how to walk anywhere except around the house, and you know the next morning would stand by the door and want to go to the park, so and knew the way to the park. So I was impressed with that. Whether it was detoxing the liver somehow um, that cleared it out, that gave them you know more oxygen and more you know more uh, mitochondrial functional liver. liver uh, but that worked really well on that dog. And I've done several others with the combination of the UVB and the added ozone uh, rectal or sub-Q. I'm finding the same thing. And I think a majority of the effect is from reducing inflammation and then probably enhancing detoxification. Great. And Dr. Jean, do you have any comment on that one? Since Yes, we do the same way. We do intrarectal, and sometimes we do at acupuncture points on the head. And ozone has a great vasodilator effect and also reduce the platelet aggregation. So we can have an improving blood circulation in the brain. And it also releases nitric oxide, so it, it's really effective to improve blood circulation despite other neuroprotective effects that we discussed before. Wonderful. And this again is for Dr. Jean. Um, so do you, have you used ozone in cases of degenerative my, myelopathy in dogs? Uh, yes, we do, but the results are not so good by now. Maybe we don't know the right protocol, maybe doing some major auto hemotherapy, but the way we use intrabrectal and paravertebral uh, has not improved the animals by now. We have been using stem cells with some interesting results, but it's a, a very challenging disease. I've been having- I'll, I'll do the ozone uh, and then the acupuncture with it. So I'll do the ozone, flood the whole, you know, the whole back area do major autohemotherapy and then do acupuncture um, as well. And it's, you know, we're getting improvement. You know, I'm not like turning these animals into, you know, young dogs running along, but they, they maintain quite well. Um, one I had for like five years that I, we didn't, I couldn't believe it lasted almost five years, but they would come in once a month and you could see the decline was there, but it was enough to keep the dog from being euthanized. I've also been very successful, and in addition to using the ozone, we do photobiomodulation, hyperbaric oxygen, chiropractic work, acupuncture, and these dogs do very, very well. Great, and, and there was one final kind of question, again, for uh, our Brazilian doctor here about his lecture with neurological disorders, and it was 
Um, I wonder if ozone can help seizures or epilepsy as part of an emergency treatment and as an adjunct treatment. Thoughts on that? Uh, as an emergency treatment, no, I think not. But uh, just like uh, CBD, ozone can can act in the intestine and I can change the, the environment. And so we can have a better absorption of some vitamins, we can have some binding proteins, we can have some biochemical reactions, and yes, we can improve seizures uh, during the time, but not on emergency situation. I presented a case yesterday of a dog that presented having seizures. We put an IV catheter in, we did give Venabarb, and we did give Valium to get the dog under control, but we did major autohemotherapy, and it was just a, a an hour to an hour and a half, and this dog made a ridiculously big improvement, and by that evening was able to be walking, and by the next day went home looking perfectly normal. And I, I've seen dogs like this before, and this dog responded very, very quickly. And I presented a Lyme's case yesterday as well, and in that dog, within hours of getting his first therapies, he was already better than he had been for months, mm. and he continued to have improvement. Okay, this, this question will be for the entire panel and uh, maybe a few who hasn't, haven't responded yet. If you have a, a thought on this particular one, that'd be great. Um, what, what about this so-called Herxheimer response in, in patients? And uh, so is that, is that legitimate, a legitimate view of what may be happening when you have a response that you're not expecting? Um, and, how, how can you counteract that, if so? Any thoughts on Herxheimer and ozone? I'll start on that one because we, when we weren't doing our detoxification processes first and we were just trying to treat these animals, we were seeing them get sicker in the beginning. And when we went back to step number one, get them in a parasympathetic state, open the organs of elimination, and then we started our treatments, haven't had a single problem since. But if you go too fast and you overwhelm these animals and they don't have the ability to detoxify, you know, think about it, if you're gonna clean the house, you have to have some place to throw it. And if they're already so congested in the lymphatics and in the liver particularly, then they're going to get sicker because they can't get rid of the stuff that you're releasing. Any other thoughts on that from other panelists? Okay, good. Um, so, Next question will be directed actually to Dr. Siegel because this was your lecture. Um, and they want to know about you have, have, do you have no Wi-Fi in your office or EMF blocking? That was the, the, the context. Okay, so I do have Wi-Fi in the veterinary office, but I also have several devices that are EMF protector. There's one device that we use, which is called the key device, and it produces a torus field, which drops electrons on everything that it contacts. This is theoretical, I can't prove it. And, and so it just coats you with these electrons that are donors to the free radicals. And in the SPAS family wellness centers, that is going to be no Wi-Fi. Mm. We're, we're building those intentionally to be hardwired. Okay, good, thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's there are other like there are other instruments or other things that you can put into your building um, you know, whether it be the, the, the salt, um, whether like the, sili the silica, I forgot the name, the, uh, the white salt, we have them all through the clinic. And then we have other companies that have different devices that, um, that disperse the, the EMFs. I have, I don't have, I have Wi-Fi in my house that only is on now, and at night we shut it off and everything is hardwired in my house. Um, and then in the, in the clinic, um, and in my, I'm doing an addition right now to do also a lecture section in my, in a garage, you know, kind of big, huge space. Um, and we're using tachyon dust. And so we're adding that to the paint and it's supposed to protect the building from EMFs. So that's been done without through the whole clinic, um, like when we built it 20 years ago. So it's part of the paint inside that clinic. So here's, here's the problem with, uh 
with doing this type of thing with the holistic veterinarians is they mention lots of things, right, that are way outside <laughs> of what normal people know about. So I'll have ozone generators on my clipboard. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> that, that so we have a few questions about tachyon. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to to answer that real quick. Oh, okay. So. One of my clients who was very intuitive got me convinced that I should put tachyon in my clinic and tachyon here and there. So I started hanging the discs onto the water because it broke up water molecules and made them more absorption, absorptive. So adding, I figured why not add it to the saline, you know, and underneath the water maker that I have in my, that we make water. And I don't know if it's any, it makes it any better, but it, we, we, that's what we do. We have those tachyon discs laying against, and you probably saw them in the thing, laying against it, and it's a silica calcium uh, product, and it supposedly helps break up these water molecules in a more form that can be, you know, utilized. And again, I can't, you know, we can't prove that the EMF stuff is working in our building and checking it and figuring it out. It's more the people that have created it have, have felt that this has really made a huge difference. And so, you know, we see, you know, and all of you are seeing ozone miracles, and it may not be have anything to do with the tachyon, but I just figure it, it's been working for us, and why not? It doesn't cost that much to add that to the disc, and I mean, add that to the outside, and add that to our water, so we just do it. Good. So one of the things that I've done to actually see whether or not there's an impact on the body is we, we study the fourth phase of water. Everybody know what the fourth phase of water is? The easy water, Dr. Pollock, Dr. Jerry Pollock's work. And that is the zone that when it expands, your red blood cells are able to separate. And when that zone contracts, you get Rouleau. So one of the things we'll do is we'll test ahead of time. We'll see whether or not there's Rouleau in the blood. If there is, then we use a device to see whether or not we can change that fourth phase of water and expand it. And if we do, then we know that we're making an impact. If nothing happens, we know we didn't. So that's a, a little more scientific at least, you know, where we actually can measure the differences that we're seeing, the impact. There was a question, Dr. Kolosov, I'm gonna direct this towards you, about um, changes in, when you bubble ozone through oil first, then it, you can safely inhale or breathe that. So there was a question about what would, you know, what in, why would that be? You know, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, hyp hypothetically, I don't, I haven't, I guess, studied very heavily the mechanism and the cascade that occurs with the difference in the change of the um, charge on the molecule. But essentially what happens is when you bubble it through oil, it changes from a ozone molecule of three, technically it's still neutral kind of in terms of it's unstable and reactive, but it's, it's not considered charged yet versus when you put it through the oil, it becomes a, a classified ozonide, which is a negatively charged molecule. Um, and so the, I guess there's a, there's a safety factor that occurs when it then does um, interact with the alveolar lining layer that is not the same in terms of causing a heavy um, pro-inflammatory polyunsaturated fatty acid reaction. That would be different or I guess may, maybe less severe um, and then doesn't result in the NFKB pathway being created at such a high um, percentage or high ratio as averse to the NRF2 pathway. I thought you might have an answer for us. So, <laughs> so great. And in, in my terms, it, it's safe. <laughs> but that is very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> so um, this question was, let's see, uh, I think for Dr. Rubin. Um, so when you are doing uh, insufflation or rectal insufflation on rabbits, um, and also the, the auricular ozone, where you bubble it through oil first. What is the, what is the kind of the, the protocol there? They wanted to know the, the concentration kind of that you're using and the volume, like the flow rate, if you know that <laughs> offhand. I want to say, it, well, I guess it depends on the machine. I, um, I have the competitor machine. I should probably... Uh, That's a problem. I have a longevity. Yeah. I, I want to say it's six and one eight, I could be wrong, I could look that up. I don't have my, I have a laminated sheet right in front of my machine, so I don't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, but it's usually anywhere from four to six minutes. If they're infected, we do six minutes. If it's not infected or it's just red or we just clean them um, or the animal is, 
having trouble sitting around, we do four minutes. That's usually what we do for the dogs. If it's a small, a smaller than that, three to four minutes. It really doesn't take much. And anywhere from 38 to 40 gamma, although I feel like now I'm learning that maybe my gamma, when I went through Dr. Schallenberger's course, it seemed like things were much higher with the way we learned. And also longevity gives you a chart to be able to, with some suggestions. And so I've been doing those things for a very long time, which today I've learned way too high. I'm thankful that, um, especially yeah. my uh, acupuncture ozone, it's, just, it's way too high. And so I'm happy that both the doctors have agreed to go lower. But as far as the ear ozone, um, that's how we do it. The rectal ozone too, uh, basically about somewhere between 35 and 40. Um, I usually do about one ml per pound. That's kind of the, the guidelines we go by. Sometimes I just use my intuition. I know that's not very scientific, but I think most holistic vets have a lot of that. And so it just depends on how much they can handle. But usually the first dose is always less than the, the consecutive doses as well. We wanna see how much, they can, how much they can tolerate. We usually increase it um, every time they come in uh, to a point where, of course, we're not gonna increase it every single time, but we get to a point where we, we can um, saturate them. Hmm. and then they seem to do fine. But uh, I always go at least half. It's kind of like the IV vitamin C. You do the half dose first, and then the second dose you can go up. Great. This is directed towards Dr. Hershey. Um, the question was, have you done vaginal insufflation as well or no? I have, I have not. Um, but now that you mention it, I have a rescue dog that lives in hospital with a refractory TDT that's not responding to anything. So I, I may just try it. Hmm. Um, and this also is directed towards you, Dr. Hershey. Um, what, in what container do you have the clients collect the urine? Is it sterile? Is that an issue? When you add ozone to it, does that affect the, you know, does that sterilize it then? And, you know. Yeah, I mean... But to be honest, we've only recently started having owners or, or free catching it ourselves. So um, a lot of times we'll free catch it and we use a, you know, we use a soup ladle that's designated as a pea ladle um, and then just pour it directly into a white top tube and withdraw it from there. Um, I used to uh, do it sterilely by cystocentesis. Um, in theory, I think the ozone would kill anything in the urine. And I, uh, other than that, that Frenchie dog, and we were getting hers by cystocentesis, I never had a problem with, you know, abscesses or, you know, any other inflammation or even, even pain at the injection, no more so than any IM injection would be. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment about the uh, urine uh, injection. So when I took Frank's class as well, you know, he, this was in 2005, and we talked about the urine and the complementary of the urine blood matching of one part of the, the reaction in the immune system. And so I was always doing a lot less urine. Um, and I would, and then I started mixing it with the UVBI solution and taking like one cc of ozone, uh, two or three drops of urine, <coughs> putting that in the ozone so I would get that fresh catch urine that they brought in that wasn't probably sterile. Um, and then mixing that with the uh, UVB solution succussing it about 30 times and then using that as an IM injection. So just for everybody's information, urine is not sterile, okay? We do cultures and sensitivities that will tell us about 12 species. There's probably 75 species in there that aren't even being identified by our microbiome studies. So, you know, there's, there's mycoplasms that wouldn't be cultured out. There's viruses that aren't cultured out. There's yeast, there's bacteriophages in the bladder and so that's why there is you know when people go on antibiotics and they don't clear up it's probably due to some other form of a microbiome that isn't a bacteria that our cultures pick up so it's a joke actually to me that people say well the urine was sterile it didn't have any growth yeah in the in the education that we have now we only know about six or eight species that it would be in it so i think by putting the ozone directly in the bladder when you have something that has a chronic UTI or chronic interstitial cystitis, you will get rid of those other organisms that may be multiplying in huge numbers and the biofilm that's there that will allow the healthy bladder cells to start to do their job. And so that's why it's important to, 
to, you know, to really look at using ozone within bladders. Um, I keep thinking, and this is another thing I haven't done yet, um, is, you know, so many animals that have been on so many bladder, you know, infl inflammations and they, to do ozone, but what about restoring the microbiome of the bladder with a urine transplant? So that's something on my list I haven't done yet. Lots of fecal transplants, but not urine transplants. Mm. Good. Thank you. Um, is there a question here in the room? Let's, uh, let's, I don't know, I haven't really looked up yet. <laughs> but Olivia, can you um, move the uh, microphone up here quick? While she's going over there to do that, I have done vaginal insufflations. Um, we did a dog that had 13 puppies and had a vaginal delivery on all of them, but on a couple of puppies I had to go in and manipulate. And so I felt like I had introduced a little more bacteria than I needed to. And so we did vaginal insufflation afterwards. Just took a Tomcat catheter, ozone gas, and just infused it up into the vaginal area. She just had puppies, so the cervix was wide open. Great. Um, I just had a, can a cancer question about lymphoma. Nobody's mentioned lymphoma, and I'm wondering if anybody's treated it um, with ozone at all. Everybody online get that? Lymphoma. Yeah, I, I have not treated a lot of lymphoma cases with, with ozone. Um, not that I, I shouldn't, but I have one patient who's just on prednisone that we are doing rectal insufflation. Um, it's very early in the, in the game, so I'm not sure you know, how, how he's gonna do, although he seems to be feeling fine. Um, I guess part of it is that you know, a lot of times if we're doing chemotherapy, we've got you know, so many drugs on board and the owner's already spending so much money that uh, you know, adding some of these other things on, even if it offered, is not always in somebody's wheelhouse, and that may be part. And that may be part of it. Um, sometimes I go to these conferences and say, "Shit, I should really be doing <laughs> more of this with my cancer patients." So my goal for next week is to do more of it. But it's uh, so I, I had one case that actually uh, Jonathan got to meet uh, Dudley, mm -hmm. um, and Dudley had T cell lymphoma. Uh, he was about a 10, a 10 and a half year old Shih Tzu poo cross. And uh, we, it was given three weeks without chemo, five months with chemo for T cell lymphoma. And we, they, you know, and the oncologist had never worked with me and they didn't really want to, but the owner insisted. And so we gave the, we gave the dog UVBI fecal transplant and ozone after the day after the chemo. And the dog never got blood dyscrasias, never got the interstitial cystitis went for two years and six months. And they ran out of different chop mop, all the other things they couldn't figure out. And I totally credit the owner for demanding us to collaborate together and to work together to try to give this dog as much time as possible. And then I had another lymphoma case. I mean, I, I do all my lymphomas with ozone. And they have, they, and, I, and I also always do the, the um, fecal transplant, the microbiome restorative therapy. That's definitely you know, done. But I had one dog who I could not get near. It was a pit bull who would take your face off. And the owner wanted to do, do did not want chemo. <coughs> and she would pick up the ozonated saline in the glass bottle and come in two or three times a week and pick it up and give it to the dog. And she also used THC. And she was using high levels of THC and some nutritional supplements that she had uh, gotten herself. And uh, that dog went about 11 months. And I thought that was really pretty good because I, I, I would have wanted to do UVBI. I wanted to do all this, but to do it on this dog, you had to knock it out. It was so aggressive. So it worked you know, for this dog for almost a year. I've done a lot of lymphoma cases. I've done them just without going through any chemotherapy. And I've had them where they've gone through their chemotherapy and then they come to me. Typically, the owners will do the chemotherapy and wait until the animals relapse before they come in. But I've had some that went through the chemotherapy and then came in and started doing some alternative therapies, including ozone. And in every single case, I found that the quality of life always improved. And, and, and one comment on, on this too, if, if you're doing ultraviolet blood irradiation at the same time as the ozone or even by itself, Keep in mind that the extracorporeal photophoresis, for those of you who are in the class, which is a very similar treatment to ultraviolet blood irradiation, and that is indicated in humans at least for treating T cell lymphoma. So that may be a, a, a really good adjunct for that type of indication. 
I think the one caution I would say is if they are going through chemotherapy and they're actively in with an oncologist, you just want to be cautious not to do things that are going to enhance the immune system too much because they're trying to suppress the immune system. So just be mindful of what you're doing and how it's affecting the overall outcome so somebody doesn't turn around and say, oh, you were the reason for the failure. So I try to be thoughtful about what I'm doing and the timing that I'm doing it in. Since we're talking about lymphoma, um, and I was thinking about a patient of mine that's got small cell lymphoma and they know that it's affecting, you know, more than just the intestines, we're having issues elsewhere. Um, is there much use for the intraperitoneal injections in those cases or would you focus on the major and the UBI and all of that? In my opinion, I would focus on major autohemotherapy with rectal ozone on the in-between days. So you're doing one day a week at least doing major autohemotherapy, take a day off and then do three or four days of rectal ozone, take a day off and then come back and do major autohemotherapy with whatever else that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've done the IP, um, intraperitoneal ozone injections for cancer on two animals that lived way beyond any expectation that I would have had. Uh, but when I do all my therapies and I tell you this stuff, there's, we're doing nutraceuticals, we're doing homeopathy, we're doing, sometimes doing hyperbaric oxygen, we're doing, but the ozone to me is the, one of the biggest players. The two, the two things that I think really have made my practice feeling like I'm really doing something is the ozone and the microbiome restorative therapy. If I can take the micro, use the ozone to kill the biofilm in the gut that won't allow a fecal transplant to occur and reduce that, that biofilm by using ozone plus stimulate the stem cells in the colon and you can get 80% of an immune system working because you're giving a healthy microbiome. That's the biggest jump that we could do. So with oxygen, and you know, oxidative stress being caused by the ozone stimulating the immune system, and then giving a healthy microbiome from, a, you know, from our donors who are 27 years, five generations, only fed organic food for 27 years. You can't find that kind of you know, diversity uh, that we can't really identify. But that to me is, is the, the biggest jump that I can have is just getting the gut to help me heal the dog. You know, I have way less case reports than any of the doctors today, but um, right now I'm currently involved as well in a, basically a, an ozone contributory um, cancer um, case that is surprising me as well. Um, cannabis, diet modification, and ozone are the only three things we're doing right now. Um, and this dog uh, has um, been alive and with a, the same exact quality of life throughout for 11 months with a proliferative osteosarcoma of the distal left them, so it's not lymphoma, but I agree that the quality of life that comes from this, um, the dog is running around playing, using that leg to a degree, and is not suffering in terms of pain at all. So, um, you know, I know it's part of a multimodal plan there, it's not a monotherapy, but the, this is a 100% something, I, you know, like I said, I haven't, we haven't changed anything except for it's on a, you know, a, a raw keto um, supportive diet with minimal soluble carbs uh, combined with um, a full spectrum hemp extract, a THC, and then ozone at least a few times a month, at least once a week, a couple of times a week. So yeah, for sure, it's, um, it's part of a multimodal therapy, whether you're trying to cure or trying to create a longevity of quality of life, I'm seeing it as well. And then you have hundreds of case reports here from other doctors. Awesome. Dr. Jean, uh, do you have, are you guys there in Brazil utilizing intraperitoneal injections? Yes, but not that much. We do that guided by ultrasound. It's a very interesting technique. Uh, we don't use that often, but when we use it, we were very su surprised with the results. Mm. Uh, I think many of the research done on rats, yeah. they use this via and the results are very interesting for cancer and in reality, each each via we use for ozone has a different effect on tumors. If you use ozonated blood, you have an effect. If you use gas inside the tumor, you have another kind of effect. And if we use ozonated saline, uh, it has a, a anti-cancer effect when you wash the tumor. It's very effective. 
if you wash the tumor, and also when you use it on intravenous. It's very safe. I think ozonated uh, fluid is the safest way to use ozone. You can use on animals with uh, anemia, very uh, animals that have an intense degree of anemia, and we have been using the ozonated fluid for many different types of disease, like poison, like uh, venous biting from snakes, from, from spider, kidney disease, it's very effective. And also for animals with cancer, even in terminal stages, it increases the metabolism, it has a different effect of the other way we use ozone. Now, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on that because I think we'll probably have different ways in which we understand the use of ozonated fluids, what we should use and the concentration we should use to ozonate those fluids. Can you explain in Brazil, do you use saline or distilled water or something else and what concentrations do you use to ozonate those fluids and why? Well, for uh, external uh, use, you can use distillated water or saline for external use for bladder wash, for tumor wash, for, for the mouth, whatever. For internal use, you must use saline or hinger. I prefer to use hinger because it has less sodium than uh, saline, 0 0.9. And in general, we use a high concentration of ozone. We use about 40 to 50 micrograms per milliliters for seven minutes for 500 milliliters of saline. And then we do that IV. If you take the research, you are going to check that even with 50 micrograms per milliliter uh, in the saline for 10 minutes the final average of concentration of ozone will be will be about four microgram per milliliter so it's you have a very low concentration in the water uh, the water can is is saturated very quickly so that's why it's safe because you have low concentration of ozone in the water, but even with low concentration, the effect is incredible. We use that for animals with tetanus, uh, intoxication, as I told you, and try it for kidney disease. I work with stem cells for about 15 years now, and I can tell you it's even much better than stem cells for kidney injury. Hmm. Oh. Can I comment on that peritoneal lavage? I presented a case a couple days ago of a dog that was coming in for a severe amount of ascites. We didn't know where it was coming from. We had worked him up for cardiac disease. It turned out that he had a prostatic cancer. And as we were neutering him, we drained the fluid out of his abdomen. We infused that with ozone gas, mixed it around. We showed it on the video. And after that, all the effusion stopped. So he didn't have any more ascites after that. Whatever he had in the abdomen that we didn't drain resorbed and he had no problems after that. So I'd have to say that the impact of the neutering did not happen immediately on the prostate gland, so it had to be the washing of the ozone over the abdomen that made a difference. So on the IP ozone, I've given um, presentations about doing it at, with a dog standing and not using ultrasound uh, by putting it in a little below the paralumbar area on the right side and just popping a two and a half inch catheter and giving ozone gas. And I had a Baxter who was an amazing teacher. He had a huge mass in his liver and he bled out completely and was told that he needed to be euthanized. And at that time he was 14. And we did IP ozone, hyperbaric, UVBI, and he lived two and a half more years and was, you know, died at 16 and a half. So, that shrunk down the tumor, it got, you know, and I, it, we did all these other forms of ozone and support, um, but what it, what it, 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 same thing, the inflammation stopped from the ozone and some of the human lectures that I've gone to in uh, Aruba and Costa Rica, 
we're presenting IP ozone for pancreatic cancer in people. So, you know, using it for pancreatitis is wonderful. Rectal ozone will get to the pancreas, um, but, you know, IP ozone for, you know, other kinds of abdominal cancers, it may just be able to just bathe around those cancers in a way that helps bring down inflammation. Mm. So we are um, almost at 6 o'clock, and uh, so we're going to have to wrap it up fairly quickly. Um, but uh, I want to ask a couple more questions that were just asked about this particular area that we're talking about. Um, one of them is, I've never understood why rectal insufflation, given, a, given regularly, doesn't disrupt a healthy rectal microbiome. So anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> so when, I, when we do the fecal transplants, we try to push the catheter in as far towards the transverse colon and then try to blow the ozone up so it disrupts the microbiome. In giving rectal ozone on a regular basis, we tell clients only to give it in the first four inches, two or three inches. You are going to damage the microbiome by doing that. You know, but you're also going to be getting all the benefits of stimulating stem cells on, in the colon cells and also taking it through the caudal rectal vein to the liver and dealing with the liver or helping the liver help it go through a detoxification. So yes, uh, ozone is amazing for re getting rid of biofilm. It's used in, in uh, human dentistry uh, for that whole reason. And so, you know, when we started incorporating it into our fecal transplants, we saw a big change in the success of the fecal transplants. And I think doing, doing the, the microbiome's restorative therapy and the ozone, and people say, well, why do you get such great success in doing it? And a huge part of it is the ozone. And I can't convince these other hospitals to do it. They do it through endoscopy and they implant, you know, a microbiome from a dog eating Hill's diet. And we're doing it with ozone and dogs that are on organic food and never had antibiotics for 27 years. So mm -hmm. it's a very different procedure. Good. And I think what happens is uh, when you're using the ozone rectally, you're actually affecting the terrain of the gut. And we're not just injecting ozone and then doing nothing else. We're injecting ozone, we're using, in my case, I use fermented foods so that we're helping to create a healthy microbiome. I use silver hydrosol, not silver, not colloidal silver. And the silver hydrosol also acts on the pathogens so that at the end of all of that, you're creating the terrain for a healthy microbial population to start taking hold and growing. Thank you. Okay, we have a, a quick question here. Um, the, the silver hydrosol, is that given orally? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. Um, I, I want to I ask this question because I think it's uh, one we get a lot. Um, so I'm going to do this one and then maybe one more, two more before we end. Um, and it's this. I have trouble deciding which method of, of administration to use. I do major autohemotherapy for IMHA and prefer to do it for cancer. I was under the impression rectal can be just as effective um, and, and thinking about using minor autohemotherapy and subcutaneous more for back issues, but um, how do you choose? <laughs> I'll start if everybody's quiet. Um, one is cost and two is what are you trying to target? So if I already have an intravenous catheter in, and in my hospital, I always use the UVBI. So consequently, it's doing major autohemotherapy with the UVBI, I can't do that unless I'm doing it through major autohemotherapy. So it's a little different. The rectal ozone, you can't do that. So one is cost, uh, two, do I have a catheter in, and three, if the animal isn't going to stay for very long, we don't have any in, in veins to even get to, and we're sending it home, that's gonna be rectal, or there could be combinations. There are times when you wanna use it intravenously and other times when you wanna save your veins and you're not doing UBBI, then you can use rectal. Hmm. Other thoughts on that question? Sometimes I alternate and I think a lot of that has to do with costs. You know, the major auto um, UBI is just more expensive and time consuming. Um, but I have some patients where they'll come in one week and we'll do a major auto UBI and then the next a visit we'll do rectal. We kind of alternate them that way. Sometimes, and a lot of times it's more, you know, to help with, to help with costs than anything else. But, you know, I've, I've done it that way. 
So what, what I try to do is if I have a cancer case, I want to get UVBI twice in one week. And then I try to encourage the clients to get an ozone generator so they can do rectal at home. And they can keep up with doing rectal or they can make water and they can you know, do vaginal if it's a female or they can do ear insufflation. So I really push the owners to get a unit because then you know, they come to me when they need the UVBI and all the rectal stuff and, the, and even the sub-Q that they could almost do at home if I train them properly. And that way, I'm, it keeps their costs down tremendously when they, you know, they, they figure out what they pay for a machine. And then the parts that they can't do, like the UVB and the major autohemotherapy with UVBI. And that's, you know, it's, but people feel like, you know, I, I can't afford $1,200. But by the time they've gone through, you know, a month of treatment, they've already spent that. And they now they have an ozone generator that they can help with their own family, other family members that can drink the water and do whatever they want that I don't know about. The problem with the protocol depends also the partnership you have with the oncologist. It depends on the type of tumor. It depends on the owner, if they are okay with this approach until what they want to risk so it's not about just the protocol. It depends on many external uh, factors mm. as well. Good. Yeah, I think that, yeah, just it's also the cost is important, especially when you're looking at what pathology you're addressing too and what are you doing with it. You know, if you have something that is a tremendous systemic inflammatory response, a chronic inflammatory response that's been going on for years, then, the you know, the protocol can be altered over time as well. It doesn't have to be the same throughout. So to load the body, to get the body saturated by whatever the, the methods that are going to be at least most effective at getting it at a, a concentration that then can be um, complemented over time by other methods that are either localized or can be done at home that, you know, Dr. Roman was saying that they can train the owners, but to at least get the body up to a position where you are neutralizing the pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory response. Um, mm -hmm. and allowing the body to get back to the state of being ready to then take over itself, um, the, the uh, neutralization and the, and the getting back to homeostasis, the, the protocol doesn't have to be stagnant throughout. It can, it's, however, it's most complementary to mm -hmm. the pathologies you're trying to address. Good. Okay, I'm going to give each uh, lecturer one minute just to give a final word to our audience. Um, if you have one, we got your pearls. This is just a, a saying goodbye and, a, and just to leave something with everybody again um, before we leave for another year. We're going to do this next year. Um, I don't know if it'll be the exact same format, but we'll decide on that. Um, and hopefully we'll have many of you uh, who were watching and a part of this back again. Um, but with that said, um, Let's, uh, let's, let's start online with uh, Dr. Rubin, if you would. Do you, do you have any final comments? Uh, I'm just really honored that you uh, thought of me uh, because I'm a rookie and I feel uh, very new to this game. This is my first time uh, doing something like this. I do a lot of television, but it's all off the cuff. There's nothing prepared. <laughs> and so I had to prepare for this and it was really difficult for me. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot, and uh, and I'm really crappy with a computer. So uh, because I never sit down, I work like a maniac, and so I don't really have a lot of time on the computer. But it it gave me a lot of good practice. And I also want to say thank you to Margo. Margo has been my inspiration. Uh, I saw Margo, uh, I don't know how many years ago now, at an AHVMA uh, lecture, uh, just a basic lecture on ozone, and I was so intrigued by it and so enthralled. Um, I have since introduced at, at least six segments on, on uh, the Fox network, and I hope to continue to do that because education is the key, word of mouth is the key, and I think success also is really important. So share your cases however you have to do it, if it's through social media or word of mouth. Uh, I think that's really the secret to success is a, it's a small community. And, uh, and we need mentors. I think Margo has been fantastic in it. I'm just so excited that we have a group of people um, that I've been invited into now that we can share these pearls and these, um, these different modalities that we're doing and offering for our patients to make a better quality life. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for being here and for 
sharing with us. Somebody just commented your, your lecture was fantastic. So you do have fans here online. <laughs> um, Dr. Hershey. I, I really enjoy going to these conferences. You know, you, I, just like everybody else, I tend to get in my groove and I get a little stagnant and then I walk away and learn all kinds of cool things. Like I'm gonna try doing um, ozone directly into the acupuncture uh, points <laughs> this week. I never thought about doing that. Um, and just, you know, a lot of good ideas and a lot of new things to put into to practice. And, you know, as much as the right as we all tend to get into, it's really nice to have these conferences and get excited about what we do. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your expertise and your time. And uh, I know you have two youngsters who are needing probably attention at home or whatever. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll finish this up in a second. But uh, Dr. Roman, why don't you go next? Well, first of all, I want to thank Jonathan because we needed somebody to put this together as a conference, to put it together as a, um, an interest in our profession that would have training and would keep ongoing information that we could all be sharing. So thank you, Jonathan. And then I, I have to say I got to thank the Brazilians because they are so far <laughs> ahead in moving the needle. I mean, there really are you know, moving that needle forward. And of course, the people that train me, like Judah Shoemaker and Tina Aiken, I, I constantly have been grateful to them for, you know, making me do something that I couldn't do. But for all of you that are starting out, and, you know, and Betsy, you know, she started doing the ozone, and it, she just totally inspired me to like, oh my God, this is, you know, we've got somebody who's a board certified oncologist who understands the value of adding this therapy into her care. And Marlene has taken it forward and all of you guys are just amazing. And Jill, you know, is just so much fun to be with and figure out things and we figure stuff out. So I want to thank everybody um, that is on this panel. And, and then of course, Zach, you blew me away. So I'm really proud that you are doing those things and would love to, you know, learn more from you, from your, your aspects of it. So I guess that's what I want to say is that this is something that is easy for everyone to get into. Any of you that are just starting out, it's such a, a positive thing. You're not going to do anything really negative. Um, and why aren't we using it more? We have so many needs in this, in this world right now to make a difference. And so I think it's a real important piece that we all help it move forward. Thank you, Margo. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, who are veterinarians, we do have a, a monthly forum that uh, Dr. Roman has been really kind to help uh, moderate and, and, and so uh, look for that and be a part of that with us if, if you would as we move forward with that. Um, Dr. Joaquim from Brazil, do you have a final word for us? Oh, I would like to thank you, John, for the initiative and for allowing me to join this group. I would like to thank the, the other speakers and colleagues and say that the most important thing on ozone therapy, in my opinion, is to understand the mechanism of action because research and protocols will never be specific for the disease or address specifically the disease you want to treat. So if you understand how it works, the mechanism of action, you can create your own protocol and use this too. Mm. So I thank you very much for this weekend. I learned a lot from each one and all of you. It was a pleasure to join you. The pleasure was definitely on our side. So thank you for your time and, and all that you've sacrificed to be with us just for today. We really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna turn now to Dr. Siegel, who's here. Uh, final words? Well, you know, starting with there's no accident that we're all here together, whether it's online or whether it's in person, our tribe has come together for a purpose. And I hope that each and every one of us looks at our own journey and realizes that we're all connected. And we're so grateful that there are these trailblazers like Jonathan and his family who have taken ozone into the veterinary world and uh, the people on the panel and you guys, you're trailblazers too. So as you get more experience and as you take it out into the world, we start becoming multiples, we become an exponential number and we really start making a difference in our profession in the world. 
And the second part is the paradigm shift to start focusing on the biology. We learned a lot of science today from several amazing individuals. And when we take that science and realize that what we're doing is we're looking at the biology of the body. So instead of treating a symptom, we're actually understanding the biophysiology of this miraculous machine that we get to call home for a little while. And the more we can be in support of that biology, the better our patients, the better the world is going to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Zach? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, I, there's no age or time in your life that um, the value of being an open-minded life learner um, does not come into play. Um, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in practice or not been in practice or how many times you've been frustrated or not. Um, the value of just going through life knowing that um, there's so much out there and to just be a conscious individual that you can always be a life learner and, and enjoy um, the ability to better yourself every single day. Um, that's, that's a choice that we have um, and you can become complacent um, where you're at or you can realize that um, all of us, again, as Dr. Siegel said, um, we're all here together and the ones that um, can come together and, and unite in this conscious open-mindedness. Um, this is just one small example of um, how a group of people can potentially make a huge movement um, and this is just one thing out of the numerous others. So yeah. um, I think that it, it, it was pretty amazing. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount in literally eight hours that I never knew. And I'm, you know, I think that everyone here just as well probably um, could, could say the same. And this is just one small day in what could be a year in a life of open-minded life learning. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you guys, all of you. Thank you for those of you who stuck with us online and are just uh, making this happen. Again, uh, it takes all of us. We all benefit from each other in various ways, right? And so I'm thankful that we can do that. And thank you guys for being here on site. It makes this a lot more fun too, to just be able to interact and eat and hang out and stuff. And uh, so till tell next year, right? Um, we are gonna go, we're gonna learn more. You are gonna be better doctors. Uh, when we come back together next year, hopefully, at least some of us. And uh, I look forward to what we can do together. And so thank you again. That's, that's all we have planned for this year. Um, go in peace. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your faces. Thank you for your faces.